Hi, I'm Sean Murray and this is The Conversation, where we take an alternative look at political events and current affairs through an Irish lens. In this show, we hope to pick, probe, investigate and uncover the stories that you want to hear. We go where mainstream won't go. This week, we take you, the audience, back to October 12, 1984. In an event that shook the British establishment, a bomb detonated at the Grand Hotel in Brighton, England, killing five people and almost killing then British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Our next guest was central to this IRA attack. But before we speak to them, let's get a quick overview on one of the most cataclysmic events in British political history. As always, we are joined by our resident co-presenter, Michelle Gildernew. Michelle is the current MP for Fermanagh, South Tyrone. She has served in the Northern Ireland Assembly as a former Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development and chairperson of the Health Committee, amongst other things. Michelle has been a Sinn Féin activist since her teens and has been elected almost continuously since 1998. And today's guest is Pat McGee. Pat is a former member of the IRA who was jailed for the Brighton bombing in 1984. After serving 15 years, he was released under the Good Friday Agreement. Pat McGee, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. Pat, before we begin, can you tell me a bit about your childhood growing up in Belfast? Well, uh, at the age of four, I actually left Belfast. The family moved to England. But my best memories of those years were up to the age of four. You know, very solid memories. I'm talking about, I can detail events that happened when I know I was only two. And I think growing up in England, I felt very alienated there. It was a, wasn't a very happy childhood, I have to say that. But I was always thinking about what I'd left behind in my grandfather's house. And I think because I used to go back to it all the time in my head, it uh, firmed up those memories. And they're, they're among the most firm memories I have. And it was a happy time. So Pat, what age were you when you came back to Ireland? And you know, what was what were those years like and what motivated you to join the IRA? Well, the family used to return to Belfast on occasions and family members from Belfast used to visit us where we were living in a place called Norwich in, uh, in England. And so I had those links, you know, and they, they remained quite strong. I first returned uh, on my own, onto my own volition when I was 19, but only for a short while. But it was specifically to see what was happening. I was concerned about what was happening as it was portrayed in the media. Uh, and you just knew that you weren't getting the full story. This is before events even kicked off uh, properly as we understand it. But I, I came back instead at 20. And what year was that? That would have been uh, 19. Uh, just after internment, so uh, 71, okay. August 71, 15th of August, it was that Sunday, or that Saturday night, yeah. And uh, again, it was that uh, desire just to see what was happening on the ground. Just before, the week before, that whole week taken up by events in, uh, over internment, you were getting a, a, a feed in the papers, and they were terrible events, and they were getting covered more than perhaps later on the press dealt with these issues. But you still knew that you weren't getting the full account. I had an aunt living in Andy Town who had a phone and I remember talking to her and she was able to tell me that it was that bad that they had to hide behind the, the settee. You know, this is a gun battle in the streets in Andy Town. And uh, so, you know, the, they weren't covering that in the news. Mm -hmm. 
And so I came back just to see for myself. And I guess over a period of time, I got to see what was happening, got a better understanding of it. I would have been kind of, uh, for example, uh, I'd, I'd known guys, uh, contemporaries who would have joined the British Army. And at that stage, I would have never have thought of them as Brits or had a bad view of them. But you're hearing all these accounts of what the, they were doing to people in the streets, you know, the abuse of people. And uh, I, I couldn't square that with what I knew. Well, you see that for yourself. You're a witness to it. And I saw how people dealt with this occupation. Uh, you know, the, <coughs> the constant raids. Our house was raided. Uh, the, the, the messing about in the streets, etc. Just general abuse you felt in a, your, in a, your home was occupied. Mm -hmm. And yet that community, it was a, it was a Carrick Hill community, them days it was Unity Flats. Uh, you saw how they coped. And they were all doing it. Uh, uh, everybody seemed to me to be uh, connected. And I just wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be included in that. Didn't know what I could do, what my contribution could be. Really did not know. But I, I at least wanted to contribute in some way. Eventually that uh, caused me to join and the IRA. When you joined the IRA, what, what year was that, Pat? 1972. 1972. So the year of Bloody Sunday was the beginning. Uh, January 72. And did the likes of Bloody Sunday, was that something that motivated you or was it what you were seeing on the streets in Belfast? More the latter. Uh, just an accumulation. I mean, a, a, there was no big, you know, event. And that, th there were many big events, but no, it was an accumulation. What was happening, the daily grind and seeing how people locally cope with that and wanting to be a part of it. And of course, just moving on a bit, and we're, we're, we're going to st uh, start talking about the, uh, the, the Brighton bomb in 1984. Can you tell me a bit about that, how you got, got involved in that? Well, uh, um, during internment, I was interned uh, from 73 to 75, a lot of time to think, and how, again, it's just about what can I do? And I recognised that effectively <coughs> the best we could do was to target England. Effectively, our actions, you know, with the little resources available to us, would count more there. And I thought, well, I've got a head start here. I was brought up in that. There's a lot of people around me, young lads, because I'm talking about uh, jail, you know, internment. They've never been out of Belfast or never been out of there, you know, where they're from in the country. Uh, I had at least that. Uh, it seemed to me that put me at some sort of an advantage, you know. And so I came out of internment with a very firm view and commitment to somehow, you know, uh, volunteer to be part of the English campaign. And I suppose the next period was achieving that end. And so <coughs> eventually I was active in England uh, and it was seen as a campaign. Uh, uh, Brighton, the Brighton operation, for all of its importance in terms of its targeting, was part of a campaign. We believed that the only way to get the Brits to the negotiating table was for a sustained campaign. Not one operation, no matter how significant, could achieve that. It was about uh, getting a, a long-term you know, uh, uh, attack in England. And uh, I think eventually we did that after a lot of stops and starts, and I wasn't part of that. I was in jail by that stage. Uh, we'd have operated in England, withdrew because of logistics involved, and then come back to it. We, that wasn't a plan, the sort of pressure that was going to be needed. It took us a long time, a long time for the movement to gain what was needed. And eventually it did. Pat, I suppose we know that the people who were operating in England or in, in Britain at all, there were sometimes greater risks. Um, and certainly the way they were treated after arrest and all the rest was um, seemed to be pretty brutal. And I'm thinking of people like Ella O'Dwyer and Martina Anderson um, the Balcom Street men, you know, there, there seemed to be a certain level of brutality against Irish prisoners in Britain and innocent or, or not, uh, yeah. they were all treated really badly, weren't they? What? It, it's uh, not quite as straightforward as that because it was a long campaign, a long history of, uh, of our people in jail in England. The, the real harsh uh, days, or the early days, where it, it was brutal was the norm. Gradually, I think we got on top of it to the point where we were respected by 
screws and prisoners alike, and you know we have established ourselves. But uh, and you mentioned Ella and. Uh, uh, and Martina, their, their, their treatment was atrocious. Absolutely. As two women isolated. Uh, they, they've got a, a harsher, much harsher re regime in terms of strip searches, etc. Mm -hmm. General messing about than any male prisoner, never mind by the Republican or otherwise. It was, it was brutal. So just know. bringing it back to the, 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 the Brighton bomb in itself, can you tell me about your role in, in, in the Brighton bomb? No, I can't really, but I don't want to. I don't want to talk about the specifics of the operation. It's just fair to say, like that, I was the person central. You know, he planted the, the device. But beyond that, I won't comment on it. And will you tell us about your arrest then, and, and what happened after the the bomb? Well, I was arrested in uh, Glasgow, in uh, on another operation, about nine months later, and. Uh, w I basically walked into a sort of a trap. Somebody else was being followed. I met them and became it was in the net, so to speak. And we led them to the rest of the uh, rest of the people we were working with. And uh, that's how I was arrested. Uh, June uh, '85. You're still tuned into the conversation. Your weekly alternative probe of political events and current affairs through an Irish lens. Michelle Gildery, my co-host, is here alongside our special guest, human rights advocate, Pat McGee. You just spoke about your time in prison uh, and you'd mentioned about Ella Louise and Martine Anderson, about the, the, how they had got it an awful lot worse than the male prisoners. T tell me, what was it like uh, in jail in England? Because I know that you were then moved as part of the uh, uh, circumstances you were moved to, to the north. Uh, tell us just a bit more about your own uh, treatment in jail. Well, uh, once you get through the the year on remand and you're so taken up with the upcoming trial that you just you're all your thoughts are about that so you don't really you know, everything else bounces off you you know you know what i mean by that but then you're 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 transferred uh, you know the the place you're going to be in for the rest of your life if they have their way uh, i was put in what's called a special secure unit these were special units they've been likened to prisons within prisons because of the security involved but there would only be, say, uh, seven prisoners, and it would be the same seven prisoners kept there for quite a number of years, very little coming or going. And there would be, uh, everything was isolated from the rest of the prison population, and the screw contingent, they would be specific for the unit. Uh, so it's very uh, claustrophobic, you feel isolated, and I, th I think it's good cause to think that uh, we all were damaged by it. I mean that, I felt it myself. There was at times when I uh, verged on a breakdown. I was that close to it. I felt it, you know. But I, I ended up uh, spending four years in two units, so eight years in total in the units, uh, before our transfer, or as they call it transfer, we call it repatriation. That's a bit of a slip there. <laughs> Uh, before my patriation, our patriation to uh, back home. Uh, and our, our families have been campaigning for that for a long time. This has got to be borne in mind, even though we were there in prison, our whole families and our communities were affected by this. Uh, the, the terrible plight of your, your loved ones having to get the meagre means together to come across twice a year, say, to see you. We'd have accumulated our visits. We couldn't do it on a weekly basis. But uh, so the pool of visits and came over t about twice a year, school holidays maybe and at Christmas. So it was really tough on families, you know. I was transferred the day after the ceasefire declaration in uh, in uh, 31st of August uh, 94. The very next day, in fact, we w we had won a concession in in uh, the jail. Uh, we were looking for sort of contact uh, 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 coverage, RTE coverage. And we got it, we got RTE coverage. And so we were able to see the declaration and the, you know, the, the cavalcade with the flags out in Belfast. There, it was, it, we felt part of that, we actually felt part of it. It was a jubilant moment, you know, a, a corner had been turned and highly significant. And just after that, and I mean within minutes, a screw came into the room and says, Pat and a couple of others says, get your bags packed. You know, you're going home. Can, can you imagine how stunning that mm -hmm. was? Mm -hmm. And uh, 
we all celebrated with a sing song out our cell windows that night. And then the next morning, we were huge security uh, transferred the whole uh, airport, put on a specially commandeered plane, handcuffed, huge security presence in the on the plane, brought to Belfast International, the old Alder Grove, transferred a, a single prison van, all of us, and brought to the prison. You couldn't believe the difference, you know. Now. How many of you were in the van and? Three of us and then a couple of screws, probably three screws, but it was all very low key. I mean, as far as we were concerned, you know, we were, we were going home, we were a step nearer home. Uh, in, in terms of the negotiations, uh, we know what was going on, things were moving ahead, but also that just we were amongst our own, even though there were screws, mm -hmm. you were hearing Nor Irish accents for the first time, you know, yeah. uh, when we were just submerged in all this Englishness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. mm -hmm. That must have been very special. And when, so the, the negotiations were going on, when did you sort of feel th or hear the first moves of, you know, the settlement and the Good Friday Agreement and the, the work that was ongoing towards that and the moves towards? Not so much here as what you know about what was happening in our present state at any given time. Standing in the dock, I knew we were good, we were good. Things are going in our direction. Uh, so, you know, the political development of Sinn Féin, et cetera, and the, 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 the mounted campaign, things were more positive at that moment. And within a year of that, you know, the, the political developments, was, and that continued. So it was going to go there, but we still knew we had to kind of knuckle down and get through with the sentence. Mm -hmm. I, I, I uh, estimated that this is just me, this is my peculiar way of looking at things. I thought there'd be a focus on a political solution before the, the new millennium. I thought that would concentrate their minds. We know it happened well before that, mm -hmm. but that was my time scale of what I thought I had to cope with personally, yeah. you know, so you're geared to that. So you were gearing up for the remainder of your sentence here. Mm -hmm. You were amongst your own people. Your family was easier for your family to visit. You didn't feel the same sense yeah, of isolation. Yeah, then you were released under the Good Friday Agreement. So how did that fail? Or? The run up to that, uh, we started a veil of the conditions that apply to all the prison, prisoners. But we were held under, um, still held under a, a home office rules, which meant we didn't get the entitlement that other prisoners had to uh, pre-release schemes, etc. Then suddenly that was conceded to us. And uh, I must have got out uh, like about a hundred days or something was spread out before. So that's kind of a preparation for it. It wasn't sudden, suddenly you're out. I was in, I think it was 12 years and four months and suddenly I'm outside mm -hmm. of prison. It's a huge moment, you know. Uh, but uh, on the, the, the 14th anniversary of my uh, capture, uh, I was released, you know, I was released. So it took place in uh, uh, December, 2000. And Pat, you struck up this extraordinary relationship with Joe Barry, whose father was killed in the Brighton bomb. Do you want, do you want to speak a bit about that and how that came about? Well, well I met uh, Joe Barry that first time in um, December, oh, sorry, November uh, 2000. <coughs> I thought it was going to be a one-off meeting. I was there, in a sense, wearing a political hat. I would try to explain to Joe, this woman, why we targeted Brighton, to put that operation in a context and hopefully do it with some sensitivity. Uh, and that first, that conversation became a conversation, it lasted three hours. And it was a very uh, incredible and tense experience for both of us, I'm sure. And it was an exchange. I was again explaining our motivations in the context of the day. Uh, she was telling me things about her own experiences of, of her father and of the, the impact of the bomb on her and her family. And she's clearly a very um, uh, sound, intelligent woman who knew quite a bit about Ireland. In fact, had visited Belfast quite soon, within a couple of years of her father's death wanting to know. Uh, I was completely unaware of, of this. 
I only got to hear about this, as I said, a matter of months beforehand. But she, this is something she was committed to achieving long before that, right from the, you know, the loss of her father. And you know, like I'm, as I'm saying, you're gauging this woman, and uh, I, at, at some stage, she, she, uh, she recited a poem she'd written, and she'd written this sometime between three and six months before actually meeting me, before we were in this room sitting talking. And there was a phrase in the poem, now I stand before you who killed my father. She had actually prefigured the moment and it was a, a really aff affecting, you know. <clears throat> and it was like a, a completely different conversation after that. And as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm, I'm getting some impression of this woman. And she's a very fine woman. And then suddenly something just blew, something just clicked. It's what I perceived in her. <clears throat> Knew must have, in some measure, coming from this man. It had come from him. She was clearly, <clears throat> the loss was apparent. And I killed this guy, you know. In other words, I killed a fine human being. And for me, it changed things. I couldn't articulate this feeling in the moment. But after that first meeting, uh, I had all these thoughts, you know, and uh, tried to put them down on paper too, you know, how to take this forward. I never for a moment thought there would be a second meeting, but I would have jumped at a second meeting. What I didn't appreciate was that Jo wanted the same. She wanted to meet me again. She also had this uh, feeling that was more to be said, more to be explored. And the next meeting occurred two weeks later. Uh, and we've been meeting quite regularly uh, for since then. Pat, it's been an extraordinary journey. Uh, and me and you have become good friends over this last number of years. And it's always good to, 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 to have you here. I want to thank you. OK, I want to thank Michelle. Uh, and you're, you're welcome back anytime. It'd be great to see you again. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Kevin. This week, we take a look at Bloody Sunday and the reverberations that followed for many years after. How has the city of Derry moved on from then? or can it ever fully? And that does it for another week. We'd love for you to join the conversation by sharing the link to today's programme to help us grow our audience across all our social media platforms. I'd like to thank our special guest, Pat McGee, and our resident co-host, Michelle Gildernew. 
In the meantime, the conversation will be back next week with more investigations and analysis. I'm Sean Murray. Bye for now.